Content warning. The Matherson marriage contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and fictional domestic abuse. If you are in a real-life Matherson marriage, please reach out to the appropriate authorities for help. Resources you may find helpful include the Pixel Project's Domestic Violence Resource page and UN Women's International Helplines list. Resources will be linked in the video description for accessibility. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading to you from The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Chapter 1 When the door had closed, not too gently, behind Basil Matherson, his wife and Joyce Lindsay gave a sigh of relief and looked at one another across the luncheon table. There was hot indignation in Joyce Lindsay's eyes and an amused cynicism in Pansy's, and she shrugged her shoulders as Joyce broke out vehemently. Pansy, why ever did you marry him? Pansy laughed. <laughs> What's the use of asking me when I don't know myself? She pushed back her chair and, rising, opened the half-closed French windows to the hot sunshine of a June afternoon that poured down onto the beautiful garden. Joyce watched her silently for a moment, then she said again more vehemently than before, Why ever did you marry him? Pansy laughed, waving a comprehensive hand to include the luxury and beauty of the room and the wide garden outside with its gay flower beds, sloping lawns, and high cedars. To get all the things I wanted, I suppose, she said. She turned abruptly and sat down on the window ledge, facing the room. What fools girls are, she said with self-scorn. What silly idiots, if they think that money and servants and a huge house and a couple of cars and... and... Anything can make up for li and anything can make up for having to live all one's life with a man one one hates. Joyce added for her promptly. Pansy shrugged her shoulders again. No, I don't hate Basil. She said honestly. There are times when I even quite like him when he stops finding fault. But that isn't often. He's go he's good to me in his own way. He gives me all the money I want. I've got more jewelry than I can wear. But all the same. She broke off helplessly, and for a moment there was silence. Joyce leaned back in her chair and looked at Pansy with critical eyes. You might have married anyone with your pretty face, she said. Pansy laughed ironically. <laughs> anyone? My dear, there wasn't anyone to marry in our village, except the curate. <laughs> I looked upon it as heaven sent providence when Basil came along. He punctured a tire outside our gate, you know, and father asked him into tea. You know what father is, the good Samaritan always. Well, he brought Basil in, she laughed. <laughs> Poor man, he was so hot and dusty, and his hands were all grease, trying to get the wheel off. He left the chauffeur at home, and he's the kind of man who never can do jobs for himself, and he made a frightful mess of it, of course. Well, he came into tea, and I poured it out, and, well, that did it. He didn't propose at once, surely? Heavens, no! But he came again and again and again to see me. Of course, and I was flattered. I was only seventeen, and I knew quite well that it was a chance never likely to come again, and that if I let him go, I should either have to be an old maid all my life, or marry the curate and live on tuppence a year. So when Basil said, Will you marry me? I said, Yes, thank you, thank you very much. And that was all. She leaned her head back against the window frame and sighed. I'm not a bit to be pitied. Really, she went on after a moment, frankly, there's nothing romantic about it. I didn't marry him to save the family from ruin or anything else like girls do in stories. I married him to please myself because I wanted to get away from the village and be rich. So it serves me right. Joyce took an apple from the dish before her and began to peel it. If you'd waited, she said sententiously, Mr. Wright would have come along. Pansy opened her eyes wide. What? In, Linz in Linstow, she scoffed. You don't know what you're talking about, my good child. People have been born in Linstow and lived there 70 years and never seen a man outside the few specimens the village produces. And they're not up to much, I promise you. Linstow's pretty, if you like trees and fields and that sort of thing. But it isn't life. It's like going round and round in a park all the time and never getting out of it. Joy shook her head. You'd have been different, she maintained. I can read it in your face. You were born under a romantic star, Pansy. By the way, where did you get that? Where did, where did you get your name? A little flush of memory tinged Pansy's face. 
was Mother's idea, bless her, she said. There were three of us, all girls, and we all had the names of flowers. My eldest sister was Lily. She died when she was quite little. Then there was me, Pansy, and Violet's still at home looking after Father. She'll be the flower of the flock. She's only seventeen. Her eyes grew dreamy as she looked out into the garden. Just as old as I was when I was married, she added, half to herself. And you've never, never had a real love affair in all your life, Joyce insisted. Pansy shook her charming head. <laughs> never! If you mean, have I ever been in love with anyone? I never have. But there was a man once who liked me, really liked me, awfully, she added naively. Basil, I suppose, Joyce said cynically. No, someone else. Pansy ran her fingers through her tawny hair. He was only a boy, of course, but he was a great, big, tall boy, over six feet, Joyce, though he was only five years older than me. And he hasn't got a penny in the world. He stayed in Lidstow for his health, she laughed. <laughs> you wouldn't have thought there was much the matter by, by the look of him, but they were afraid he was outgrowing his strength. He said himself that it was all nonsense, but he liked Lidstow. He liked idling about in the country. Making love to you, I suppose, Joyce supplemented dryly. Pansy made a grimace. He wanted to, but I wouldn't let him. I wonder what's made I wonder what's made me think about him today. It's four or five more than five years since I saw him. He's probably thinking about you, that's why, Joyce said promptly. I believe in telepathy. Rubbish Pansy got up from the window sill. I suppose I'm very wicked, talking about Basil as I have been, she said ashamedly. After all, He's Buster's father, and Buster's the most wonderful thing that ever was, she added, and her careless voice was softened, almost reverent, as she spoke of her little son. Buster's a darling, Joyce agreed, but that doesn't make Basil any less of a pig, and I... She broke off with a gasp of dismay as the door opened, and Basil Matherson came back into the room. He was a square-shouldered, rather red-faced man, with brows that perpetually frowned, and a surly mouth in spite of its weakness was fifteen years older than his wife, and looked more, and lately there was always an unconscious disapproval in his eyes when he spoke to her. I forgot to tell you, I've asked a man to dinner tonight, he said, and, as Pansy did not answer, he added sharply, Do you hear? Yes. Her face, her pretty face grew antagonistic as she looked at him, and in her heart she was wondering in dismay why it was that she and Basil could never get on amicably, why it was that each seemed to rouse hostility in the other. She did not ask who the expected visitor might be. She was used to her husband's way of bringing in strangers at all hours of day and night, and she had ceased to be interested, but her face flamed angrily when he added as he turned to go, And get Buster out of the way. It's scandalous the way you're spoiling the child. You ought to be in bed. He ought to be in bed by six every night. He was gone before she could speak, shutting the door, and Pansy took an angry step towards it. Then she changed her mind and laughed. <laughs> That makes me angry, and he knows it. I hate to be told to, I hate to be told I spoil Buster. Besides, it's not true, is it, Joyce? Joyce temporized. Nobody could blame you if you did, she said, and then, doesn't Basil like him? Oh, yes, he really, he does, really, but he's in that mood today where he must say things to annoy me. It's silly to mind, but, well, I do. It makes me feel murderous when he speaks about Buster. Why should the child go to bed at six on these glorious evenings? I think it's cruel to expect it. Surely it's far better for him to be out in the sunshine than cooped up in a stuffy bedroom. Joyce laughed. <laughs> Pansy, as if any of your rooms are stuffy. Pansy laughed too. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. And who was Basil bringing in tonight, I wonder? Joyce asked after a moment. Goodness knows. Some old fossil, I suppose. He gets hold of such queer people. Pansy knit her level brows. I've wondered lately if there's anything the matter with that Basil is so... I've wondered lately if there's anything the matter that Basil is so unkind and snappy. What could be the matter? You never know. I asked him once, but he bit my head... I did ask him once, but he bit my head off, so I let it alone. Pansy sighed. <sighs> Men are queer. She stood for a moment, lost in thought. Then she turned abruptly and went out through the open French window into the garden. There had been a time, just after her marriage, when Pansy had thought Greenwich Gables the most beautiful spot on earth. 
She thought herself the luckiest girl to be its mistress, but lately she had, she had changed her mind. This afternoon she was not sure that she did not hate it as she walked across the perfectly kept lawn. Her husband always said Buster spoiled it by playing horse up and down its velvet smoothness and sat down at the foot of one of the old cedar trees. This was one of the days when Pansy regre regretted her marriage, and there was something tragic in the soft lines of her face as she leaned her chin in her hands and stared dreamily past the beds of brilliant flowers and bushes of roses to the belt of trees and misty hills beyond. She had made such a muddle of her life, and she had meant to be so clever. For a long time, the consciousness had lain dormant in her mind, but today she allowed herself to realize all that it meant. Her wealthy marriage had given her nothing except the things which her husband's money could buy, and happiness was not amongst their number. It had given her Buster, certainly, and she adored Buster, and yet, yet, she was not happy, not satisfied. Deep down in her heart, she always seemed to be longing for something beyond her reach, to be conscious of an emptiness in her life, a want unsatisfied. She was only twenty-two, but she felt years older as she looked back over the five years that divided her from life in Lidstow Village before she met Basil. It had been dull and uneventful, and she had taken the first possible means of escaping from it, and yet the years since had not been so very much better save in their degree of luxury and extravagance. She had been to New York and Paris, and had bought frocks in both places. She had floated down the Grand Canal in Venice by moonlight, and instead of the romance and delight she had hoped to experience, she had only been conscious of an unexplained heartache. There had been something missing from the picture, something wanting, and although until today she had been afraid to admit it, she knew it was all explained by the fact that she did not love her husband. It was nothing to her, even the half-affectionate tolerance with which she had regarded him in the early days of the marriage had gone, and he merely jarred upon her and irritated her. Possibly she irritated him in the same way, for, at any rate, he had grown more indifferent and ill-tempered, until now they never seemed to be on good terms. Looking back to the very first days of their courtship, Pansy was sure that Basil had loved her then, even if he did so no longer. In his own limited way, he had been an ardent lover. He had given her no peace until she had agreed to marry him. He had promised her the happy ever, happy ever after, ending of all the fairy stories. Well, none of it had come true, even as Lynn Ramsden had prophesied. And for the second time that day, Pansy Matherson thought of her boy sweetheart with a pang of remorse. He had adored her, and she had laughed at him. You're only a boy, she had teased him. You'll fall in love lots of times before you get married. And when he had protested that he would never love anyone else as long as he lived, she had found other excuses for not wanting him. You haven't gotten any money, and I mean to marry a rich man. She could remember the honest scorn in his eyes as he answered her. All right, marry for money. You won't be happy. You won't be satisfied. You see if I'm not right. And he had been right. The Matherson wedding had been the talk of the county. Pansy's portrait had been in all the society papers, and the fair had been looked upon as a wonderful romance, a king, Cafetua, and the beggar made story. But it had not brought her happiness, as Lynn had said, and she wondered what had become of him, and if he had altered very much since the days when he used to wait for hours outside the vicarage in the hope of catching a glimpse of her. Six years was a long time. He must be twenty-nine now, no longer the boy she had called him. She wondered if he ever thought of her. Perhaps he was married. Perhaps even he, even he had a little son like Buster, or a little daughter. She hoped he was happy wherever he was. She felt a little ashamed of the way she had treated him. She was afraid she had been very heartless, and perhaps now she was being punished for it. The last time they had met had been one May evening, when the lanes all round Lidstow were fresh and green, and white crowned with hawthorn, and Lid had come to say goodbye. He had coaxed her to go for a walk with him for the last time, and he had been very quiet and sad, and much more of a man than she could ever remember. And he had talked very little, but he had given her an address which he had which he had said would all and he had talked very little, but he had given her an address which he had said would always find him. Always <laughs> She had scoffed, and he had answered, Well, for long enough to make it matter. I shall know it's no good if you write. Well, for long enough to make it matter. I shall know it's no good if you don't write before a year. Why should I write? She had demanded impatiently, and he had answered, To ask me to come back. She had laughed at that, a cruel little laugh, and he had gone quite white and looked at her with fierce eyes as he said, Someday you'll be sorry for the way you have treated me. 
Had she been? Not yet, she knew. But she was essentially honest, and something in her heart seemed to tell her that it was not too late to be sorry, even now. And then, at the vicarage gate, with the cool gray of the spring evening all around them, Lynn had asked her to kiss him. Just once, just for goodbye, he had pleaded, but she had refused, and he had turned away, only to come back immediately, and he had taken her roughly in his arms and kissed her lips once, a hard, unforgettable kiss that had burned in her her memory and was still there. Some day you shall, some day you shall give me that kiss again. It was the last thing she heard him say as she turned and ran into the house, angry tears smarting in her eyes. She had met her father in the hall, and he had stopped her headlong, headlong flight. I thought I heard young Ramsden's voice, my dear. Isn't he with you? He asked, and she had answered passionately. He was, but he's gone, and a good job, too. She had struggled to escape from her father's kindly grasp, but he held her fast as he said, Pansy, I'm afraid you're not very kind to that poor boy. And she had answered him, He's so silly. He should, he should let me alone when I tell him to. I thought he was going away, her father had protested, and her own answer had been given with a toss of the head. <laughs> That's... That's what he says, but he'll come back all right. He always does. But Lynn had never come back, and Basil had walked into her life and never left it again. And now she had been married to him for what today seemed five long, weary years. Buster was four, bless his heart. The somberness of Pansy's gray eyes brightened as she thought of her son. He was everything to her. All her ambitions were centered round him. She had such plans for his future. He should have the, he should have the most wonderful education. He should go to Cambridge. Pansy's father had been to Cambridge in his youth, and Pansy had been brought up to believe that without such an advantage, one could do nothing in the world. Not that her father had ever done much, poor man. He was still a country parson struggling to do good to his neighbor on a small and insufficient income, helped since her marriage in every possible way by Pansy, who was devoted to him. That was another cause of irritation to Basil. When I married you, I didn't marry the whole family, he had said hundreds of times. Every man should be able to stand on his own feet. And so father can. Pansy had defended her father angrily, but you ought to be glad if you can make the place he stands in more comfortable. But Basil was not glad. He liked to conduct his charities in a way that all the world could see. He liked to head his subscription list with a large sum. He saw no sense in doing good by stealth. In his opinion, nobody had any right to be poor, and if they were, he considered it their own fault. To Pansy, who knew just how hideous a thing genteel poverty is, these, sens these sentiments were unbearable. You deserve to want, she told him one day. You deserve to lose your money and be so poor that you have to look at every penny before you spend it, to have to make clothes last five years and clean them and turn them and pretend they're new. Oh, I know so well what it is. I know. Well, you don't know now, he had been his only retort. You've got everything in the world you want. Had she? She knew she had not. And as she sat there in, in the silence of the beautiful garden, she wondered if all her life was to be as it was now. Luxurious, easy, and yet, how unsatisfactory. Dodie, Dodie! A shrill little voice broke the silence, and Pansy started to her feet as a small boy in a blue jersey suit came scampering across the lawn, a joyous little figure in the afternoon sunshine. Buster had always called his mother Dodie, a queer little name of affection coined in his own small mind, and which was a constant source of irritation to his father. To his father. Why don't you make the boy call you mother? He demanded of Pansy, and Buster himself had answered defiantly. Because she's my Dodie, and I shall always call her Dodie. Basil also objected to the name Buster. Idiotic, he declared. The child has half a dozen good traditional names, and you call him Buster. It's most unsuitable, to say the least of it. But after several years of protest, he had yielded to the rest of the household to the rest of his household, and Buster remained Buster to the end of the story. He fell into Pansy's arms now with a cry of delight. Where have you been, Dodie? I've been looking for you everywhere. Pansy kissed his flushed cheek. I've been here, that's all, darling. What did you want from what did you want me for? Better Buster hugged her more tightly. Nothing. Except that I just wanted you. They made a charming pair as they hugged and kissed one another, and an onlooker would have found it difficult, save for their great resemblance, to believe that Pansy was the mother of this sturdy boy. The book they both had the same tawny brown hair and dark fringed gray eyes, and it was a secret delight to Pansy that her son was so much like her and so little like his father. For the first three years,
years following his birth, she had jealously done everything for him herself, in spite of Basil's protests. And it was only when he began to get strong-willed, and a little beyond her, that she consented to Joyce Lindsay coming to live with them to, to help look after him. Joyce and Pansy had been friends ever since one of Pansy's rare seaside holidays had brought them together, though Joyce was much the elder of the two, and very different from Pansy. She was blunt, and never hesitated to speak her mind, and she apparently disliked Basil as much as she loved his wife. But she was goodness itself to Buster, and sufficiently tactful to know when, when to efface herself. "'I don't know what I should do without you,' Pansy often said to her. She made a confidant of Joyce, with the full consciousness that her confidence would not be abused. But she felt a little remorseful now as she walked back to the house with her arm round Buster's shoulders. Perhaps she should not have said so much about Basil. After all, he was her husband and Buster's father. She made up her mind that she would be extra nice to him at dinner tonight, that night. She took great pains with the toilet to please him. She knew he liked, his, liked her to appear at her best before his friends. She saw that Buster was safely out of the way and in bed long before the gong rang for dinner, though he protested loudly at being sent to bed while the sun shone. I shan't go to sleep, so there, he declared rebelliously. Not even to please me. Pansy asked. Buster turned his face into the pillow and made no reply. Pansy walked to the door. I'm going, she said. No answer. Pansy opened the door. I'm almost gone, she said again. Still no reply. Pansy walked out of the room. I'm quite gone, Buster. Buster started up. Dodie, darling. Pansy flew back to him. You do love me. Lots and heaps of lots. Kisses and more kisses. And you'll be a good boy and go to sleep? Yes, of course I will. Good night, my precious. As she closed the door again, he called after her. I'm almost asleep, Dodie. You're an angel, said Pansy. She went downstairs, humming a little song. Her depression of the afternoon had gone, and she was ready and eager to make amends for the disloyal things she had thought of her husband. She pushed open the door of his smoking room. Basil, dear? Then she saw that he was not alone. There was a man with him, standing looking out into the garden. They both turned as she spoke, and her husband came forward. She saw with dismay that his frown had not lifted, and his voice was irritable as he spoke. Where have you been? I sent Smales to look for you ten minutes ago. He half turned to the he half turned to the man behind him. Ramsden, let me introduce you to my wife, Pansy. This is Lynn Ramsden. Pansy caught her breath with a harsh little sound. She had been thinking of Lynn Ramston all day, and now, after six years, she was face to face with him again. It was fate, she told herself, and an unkind fate of which she she felt afraid as she reached as she raised her eyes to meet Ramston's face. You're such a boy. Her own scornful words of years ago came back to her, only now they were no longer true. The boy at whom she had once laughed because of his love for her had gone, and a man stood in his place. He had changed so much, and yet so little. The blue eyes looked down at her now with a kindly, quizzical smile, instead of the old adoration. The shaven lips that had once quivered beneath her unkindness smiled carelessly now, as, after the barest hesitation, she held out her hand. How do you do? It was with no thought of deception that she did not claim him as an old acquaintance. It was just that her thoughts were too disturbed and surprised at the unexpected meeting to be coherent. Smales, the butler, came to the door. Could I speak to you for a moment, please, sir? Matherson looked at his wife. Show Rams in the garden, Pansy. I suppose dinner will be late, as usual. Pansy turned, her pale face flushing. Dinner is never late, unless you keep it waiting, she retorted sharply. Her nerves were jarred, and she felt unstrung as she walked past Ramsden into the garden, miserable and ashamed. What had he thought of what had he thought of the way in which she had answered Basil? Lynn spoke beside her. You have a lovely place here, Mrs. Matherson. She looked up swiftly, nervous tears in her eyes. She could not understand her agitation, but her heart was beating unevenly, and her voice sounded constrained when she asked impulsively, Oh, did you know it was me? When I came here, do you mean, he asked. No, I did not know. I was surprised. Pansy laughed nervously. <laughs> Where are you? I don't think I was surprised to see you. I've been rather thinking about you all day. Really? His voice was politely interested. Yes, Pansy rushed on. I told Joyce, and she said it was telepathy. She said you must be thinking about me, too. She believes in all those sorts of things. She was so nervous she hardly knew what she was saying. But she came to herself with a little steady and gasp when Ramsden said calmly, Joyce, I don't think I know Joyce, do I? Pansy laughed. Oh, no, of course you don't. I forgot. She lives with me. She helps me look after Buster. Lynn Ramsden laughed, too. <laughs> Buster? And it was Buster. Pansy stopped. She looked
looked up at him, a faint flush changing her cheeks. He's my son, she said. She thought that the faintest flicker of emotion crossed his face, but it was gone so quickly that she wondered afterwards if she had just imagined it. Do you have a son? He said. How old is he? He's just four, and he's the darlingest. Oh, you'll love him. I'm sure I shall. His voice was perfunctory, and he looked away from her across the garden. It must be how long since we met, he asked. Pansy told him instantly. Six years last month. Don't you remember? It was May, and all the Hawthorne was out in the lanes when you came came to say goodbye. Uh, don't you remember? Yes, he laughed reminiscently. I've often thought about it since, and how angry you were because I kissed you. Was I? Her voice sounded subdued. Father said afterwards that I was not very kind to you. Father liked you. And you didn't, eh? He was a little flushed as he looked down at her. I think your father was right when he said you were not very kind to me. Pansy's eyes fell. It was all so long ago, she said faintly. Yes, six years is a long time, he agreed. And where have you been all this time? And where have you been all the time since? Pansy asked. I was at home for a year, wasting time, waiting for you to write to me, as I said I should. Then the war broke out, and I joined up. I did two years in France. Then they sent us to India, and I came back about four months ago. And how long have you known Basil? Ramsden hesitated. Not very long. A few years, a few weeks, that's all. Pansy looked up. But he calls you by your Christian name, she exclaimed. Does he? Well, what does that matter? Lots of people call me by my Christian name. You used to at one time. I know. She moved on across the lawn, and he strolled beside her. Does Matherson know that we've met before? He asked. I, I don't think so. I don't know. I forget if I told him. Pansy felt confused. There's no need for him to know, is there? Ramsden shrugged his shoulders. Better tell him, don't you think? He said impartially. These things always ha always seem to come out. Better tell him. Very well. Pansy stood, st Pansy stood still. There's the dinner gong. We'll go back, shall we? They returned to the house, and Joyce joined them in the hall. Pansy introduced her to Ramsden. It's so queer, she said nervously. Mr. Ramsden and I met years ago, didn't we? Lynn assented gravely. Yes, I was very much surprised to find I already knew Mrs. Matherson. Basil came from the library, and they went into dinner. Your wife and I have discovered that we your wife and I have discovered that we knew one another years ago, Matherson, Lynn Ramsden said casually. It's a small world, isn't it? Basil looked at Pansy. Knew one another years ago. Where? he asked. I once spent a summer in Lidstow, for the benefit of my health, and Mr. Trema Tremaine kindly asked me to tea once or twice. A pretty little village, Lidstow, but dull. Don't you think so, Mrs. Matherson? Dudley, Pansy agreed lightly. He need not have spoken quite so contentiously of the days which, after all, had been happy ones, she thought resentfully, and she wondered if he had really forgotten that for three months he had practically, he had practically spent all his time at the vicarage. She had not been able to move a step without finding him beside her, tall and romantically in love. She looked at him across the table with resentful eyes. The stripling lover had changed into a broad-shouldered man, who was perfectly indifferent to her, and a swift pang of regret touched her heart. Did all love, even the most ardent, die so soon, she wondered. Lynn had sworn that he would never love anyone else, and so would Basil. And yet now, after only six years, she sat here with both of them, and Lynn looked at her with the eyes of a stranger, and Basil with impatient disapproval. She gave a quick sigh, and her husband spoke sharply. What's the matter with you tonight? You haven't got a word to say. Pansy roused herself, with, and with an effort controlled the sharp reply that trembled on her lips. I was listening to you, she said. You generally tell me I talk too much. There's no medium with you, Matherson grumbled. It's everything or nothing. He looked at Ramsden with a smile that was ill-tempered. Don't you ever get married? Don't you ever get married, he said. Ramsden laughed. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever likely to. You will if you meet the right woman. Joy Sorry. You will if you meet the right woman, Joyce struck in, in her downright way. You'd have been married before if you'd met Mrs. If you'd met Miss Wright. Ramsey, sorry, Ramsden looked at Pansy and laughed. <laughs> it's not much good meeting the right woman if you don't happen to be the right man, he answered. Pansy pushed her plate away. What a silly conversation, she said petulantly. And that is the end of chapter one of The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Thank you for listening to this chapter with me, and I hope you return soon for the next one. Have a great day!